Engulfed in a matter of minutes, this Cessnock home stood little chance. The fire tore through the fibro property room by room, practically destroying it even before fire crews arrived. A large, very large. It was very quick. It went up very quickly. Oh, a lot of, a lot of fire heat. I was inside and heard crackling, so come out and yeah, the house was up in flames. The drama unfolded at seven o'clock this morning. Neighbours feared the worst. And there was a 34-year-old man. He was dragged from the back of the house, his face and hands badly burnt. Pretty scary thinking someone was in there. The victim was airlifted to Sydney's Royal North Shore Hospital in a serious condition as his house became a crime scene. Neighbours reported hearing yelling, followed by doors slamming and a car speeding off just moments before the house burst into flames. That will no doubt form part of the police investigation to determine exactly what caused the fire. Officers have since all but ruled out suspicious circumstances with the fire likely sparked by a faulty heater. Tyson Cottrell, NBN News. The human faces of the greyhound racing ban. After three days of industry aftershocks, those in the Hunter are united and ready to fight. Greyhound breeders, owners and trainers CEO Brenton Scott has hit the ground running, travelling around the state to master opposition to the move announced by Mike Baird late last week. We intend fighting this across uh, every opportunity, every avenue we have. Today he was rallying the troops at Warners Bay Sports Club. We've been hit with a government juggernaut. Uh, they were totally prepared. We had no consultation, so we've attempted to deal with it as best we can. Lake Macquarie breeder and trainer Kevin Gordon was elected to represent the region. He says racing runs in the veins of the region's workers. It's their job, it's their livelihood, it's their social activity, it's just everything to them. And there's thousands and thousands of those in New South Wales. The group today called on breeders, trainers and enthusiasts to implore state MPs to oppose the ban, stating it's a numbers game to defeat the legislation when it's introduced to state parliament next month. It's a simple fact of mathematics. If 12 of the 17 National Party people jump ship and vote against the proposal of Baird's proposal, it doesn't get through Senate, so it doesn't happen. Georgina Smythe, NBN News. A silent walk, but the message was loud and clear. Carrying olive branches and signs of amnesty, refugee advocates marched into Civic Park. A traditional welcome to country and smoking ceremony setting the scene for a cultural celebration. The Unity in Diversity event was a prelude to this month's National Refugee Week and organisers say it was also a timely show of strength amid xenophobic politics nationally and abroad. Well unfortunately we've seen the rise again of a politics of fear and hate and absolutely this festival does a lot to counter that. Dividing people, the situation will only get worse. The event used demonstrations, stalls and kids activities to break down cultural barriers. Vendors also gave visitors something to really sink their teeth into. Shams, an Afghan refugee cooking traditional meat and palani. National Refugee Week begins on July 19. Georgina Smythe, NBN News. Apart from us loving building stuff, it's the enjoyment that the kids and the parents get out of, out of what we create.
Edgeworth had the best early chance, Daniel McBreen teed up Brody Taylor. The Eagles should have opened the scoring a minute later, but the Post and Nicholas Hartnett ensured it stayed nil all. Broadmeadow Scott Pettit didn't get enough on his shot as the sides went to the break level. The Magic lost skipper Peter Haynes to injury, but the visitors still had several good looks early in the second half. Jim Fogarty was proving impossible to beat. The Eagles started to get the upper hand as McBreen's header went wide. The game truly came to life when Japanese import Moriyasu came on as a substitute. His free kick forced a solid save. He then had a great chance at the back post. The home side did eventually break the deadlock through Taylor. Then in stoppage time, Moriyasu showed why he's being shopped around to A-League clubs giving his visiting entourage plenty to cheer about. Was the Greyhound ban partly politically motivated? Has a deal been done with Mike Baird to support future legislation? There's no deal as such been, uh, brought, been put in place with Mike Baird. I've made it very clear to him that I'm neither right nor left, up or down. 
If you want to help and stand by animals, I will help and I will stand by the government. There are suggestions the state government will need Mark Pearson's Animal Justice Party support in the upper house down the track. Mr Pearson says he doesn't make deals, although he is surprised by Labor's position to oppose the ban. Luke Foley promised me that he, he would, his government would, or his, his party would turn their mind to animal welfare issues after I was elected. Well, the public response is overwhelming in support of the phasing out and the ban of the industry. The ALP remains unconvinced. The impact on the Walls End community will be enormous and economically we can't afford to lose any more jobs. While the politics of the decision will continue to be debated for some time, focus is now turning to the future of venues like this. The Gardens Greyhound track is Walls End FC's home ground. Now the football club isn't sure where it stands. If we were potentially allowed to still play here, um, a, the, a community run club can't afford the upkeep of a facility like this. And such questions Sonia Hornery believes have been lost in the process. I'm asking the government to give the industry a chance. Samuel Jordan, NBN News. A path of destruction. This is the guy's backyard in Fletcher after a runaway rig came crashing in on Saturday night. They were in the kitchen when they heard a bang just before 7 o'clock. Stuck my head around over the gate there and yes, there's a truck in our bedroom. The truck came to rest right on top of their bed. We don't go to bed early, which is good. The rig was towed away later that night, the couple's lucky escape only sinking in a few hours later. Just a, a, a kiss and a cuddle and yeah, just sort of, OK, next step, what do we do? Their bedroom is now covered in bricks and plaster, their ceiling held up by support posts. The only other casualties, a lawnmower and some beloved garden ornaments. Could have been a lot worse than if somebody had been in the truck or if the truck had hit a vehicle coming down the street because it's a busy, busy... Um, Street. The truck is believed to have rolled a short distance from an adjacent street hitting this street sign before ploughing into the couple's home. It's the third time a vehicle has hit their county drive property in 15 years. We've had a couple of episodes out the front and they just seem to be getting uh, more dramatic as they <laughs> yes. go along. The RMS is investigating whether the rig suffered mechanical failure. No charges have been laid. Georgina Smythe, NBN News. Historic buildings, leafy streets and Federation gardens, just some of the things that define lawn. But residents say the development of this site could bring it all undone. The owner is selling this house and subdividing the adjacent vacant land to build six dwellings with double garages. The fact that there are little town houses going up don't really meet what the, uh, the leafy lawn, if you like, um, ethos. The Belmore Road proposal went before Maitland Council earlier this year and was recommended for refusal on the basis of being inconsistent with the area's heritage values. But it was later approved with strict conditions. Now members of the community are rallying council to reverse the decision. There is quite sufficient land around Maitland. There are estates on every road in and out of Maitland, uh, away from the CBD, but all within probably 10 minutes of the CBD. As more of the hunter's population moves into these outerlying suburbs, lawn residents fear the Warrain development could set a dangerous precedent for more subdivisions on heritage land. I just sometimes think this might be the thin end of the wedge. Maitland Council was unable to comment today. Georgina Smythe, NBN News.
it is just uh, absolutely thrilling to, uh, to be able to talk to all these people and it invigorates our own research. It's the latest in a spate of house fires. And sadly, it's believed the devastation was preventable. The blaze sparked by one of winter's top home hazards, a heater. Firefighters say it's a brutal reminder to all of us to take extra care. Maintaining a safe distance from the heater, so not using clothing, anything like that, hanging up clothing around the heater. So we say, you know, keep a metre from the heater. The incidence of house fires can jump by more than a quarter during the cooler months. The average amount of uh, home fires that occur during winter is over 1,200 and out of that 1,200 uh, home fires there's about 550 injuries ranging from very serious to, to, uh, to less serious. The 34-year-old man injured in this blaze yesterday at Cessnock remains in a Sydney hospital now listed in a stable condition. Firefighters say it's a good idea at this time of year to take stock of household dangers from the kitchen to electric blankets and clothes dryers. People can go and do their own uh, home fire safety checks. Um, there's a facility for doing that on Fire Rescue New South Wales website and they can go through a checklist and make sure that their home is as safe as possible. They're also urging people to check and replace smoke alarms where necessary. They were just setting me up and then finally broke the news that I was making it. And Luke Longley at 7 foot 2 and 140 kilos, he was the closest coach to me. So I just reached up, picked him up out of his seat and gave him a big bear hug. And, uh, and since then I haven't been able to get the smile off my face. If he wants to play at 60%, we're, we're more than happy to have him on board. But, you know, again, it's a, it's a decision that needs to be made with his, uh, his overall health and well-being in mind. Happy to be back directing traffic after 11 weeks on the sideline, Mullen admits retirement crossed his mind during his recovery. I would be lying if I'd say I didn't. Um, you know, I've had a lot of injuries over the past couple of years and um, yeah, it, get, it does get a bit frustrating. But um, I'm happy to be back out there training with the boys and um, yeah, it's, just a, it's a good feeling to, to hopefully be playing on Sunday. The 29-year-old suffered the injury against Manly on Anzac Day and was only cleared to resume full training last Friday. The skin come back really good, so it does more for a mental side of things. So in the game where you know you sort of see a gap or you you think you're going to go and you, you're not sure how the hamstring's going to go, but um, you know, it was it was fully healed and um, you know best it could have been. Mullen says he won't play against the Storm unless he remains pain free this week. I am three weeks ahead of schedule at the moment, so um, look if, if there's any sort of doubt in it, I'm not going to obviously push it and you know risk surgery and stuff like that again. But at the moment, it's going really well and um, I'm getting through everything they're asking of me. Peter Matautia also suffered a serious injury in that loss to the Sea Eagles. Preparing for his third game back, he couldn't be happier to see Mullen return. Yeah, look, Jared's um, actually my idol. Um, he's been my idol since I was 14, so yeah, personally it will be good to have him back, but for the team, um, it's a, it'll be a big bonus if he plays this week, um, especially for that right edge. Matautia has recently watched his brothers Sione and Pat shifted to the back row, but he's not about to follow them into the pack. No, I'm sweet where I am. Um, I don't think I could make 35 tackles and 14 hit-ups every week, so 
yeah, look, um, they deserve to be there. They eat most of the food, so um, yeah, look, um, I thought Shani played real good there, and and Pat will definitely find himself back in the side soon. I don't think the, the final result was a true indication of the game. We matched them for much of the game uh, through the midfield, just uh, struggled to get up forward to convert, and they just took the opportunities. Uh, a little bit more skillful and probably a little bit more experience was able to, uh, to get them goals at vital times. A new enemy on their doorstep. This is what Red Zone residents found in drains outside their houses last Friday. After years of deception, they say they now document everything. Residents, once they saw what was going on, actually started going out the front of their houses and filming the foam in the drains out the front of their properties. Today, the thick foam sat stagnant in Moore's drain. Residents still don't know if it's toxic. This shouldn't be sitting in the drains along the side of roads out the front of people's houses. It's, it's unacceptable. It's the latest hit for affected residents dealing with the flow-on of the contamination scandal now in its 10th month. It makes Saltash man Ryan Baker sick to his stomach. In this drain right here in front of us, there's yummies in there. Uh, we used to eat them. We weren't we never told that it was contaminated. Fed up with waiting for results from the EPA, the community has paid out of its own pocket for independent testing. It expects to get results in a week. We need to know the results as soon as they know them because it, it gives uh, the people of this community, it gives them the security of knowing that the kids are right to walk along the grass or you know, they play in the yards and that sort of thing. You, you can't leave people hanging just because you don't want to release results. In a statement, a spokesperson says the EPA is working with state and federal stakeholders to assess and confirm the nature of any potential risks caused by the contamination. And reports commissioned by the Department of Defence will be provided to the EPA in the coming weeks for review and analysis. Georgina Smythe, NBN News. We believe the offender has attended the wrong address. Um, the male offender has, a, has assaulted the male and has left that premises with um, some property.
Kevin Gordon is getting ready for the race of his life, but it's one Marlow and Klein will have to sit out. Elected on Sunday to represent Northern New South Wales, the part-time trainer has 21 days to get the state government to reverse its proposed greyhound ban. Based in Lake Macquarie, he's racing around the region to rally trainers, breeders and politicians to boycott the ban. It's a bit of both at the moment and, uh, and getting the intel back from our group in Sydney, of which I'm now a part of, of what's actually going on. The steering committee is also using a petition as a stalling tactic in the New South Wales lower house. I think we'll get 10,000, I think we'll probably end up with 20,000. The industry has until August 2 to gather support before the Baird government introduces legislation to the upper house. Mr Gordon says the Premier has overlooked recommendations he presented when announcing the ban late last week, including those that have already been implemented, such as lifelong tracking of dogs and curbing of overbreeding. That has produced 50% less greyhounds born in this state. He says so-called industry wastage has been overstated. His own granddaughter Izzy finding a best friend in ex-race dog Maddie. Why aren't we being judged on the last 15 months, not the last 50 years? But the bets will still be on if they don't cross the line next month. Then we'll go legal, all right? It'll, it'll, it'll go, go legal, it costs a lot of money, but there is a lot of money being raised. Mr Gordon will travel to the northwest and mid-north coast later this week. Georgina Smythe, MBN News. For little ones like Evie, the National Disability Insurance Scheme has been priceless. But after it changed its payment system on July 1, it's cost many thousands. We're well into the red zone is what our provider members are telling us. Um, they are very nervous about, um, about what's going to happen into the future. Since the new online system launched, it's been plagued with errors, preventing hundreds from claiming for services. Some of them now are going on a month uh, without receiving funds from uh, the work that they've already provided. In a statement, an NDIA spokesperson says the agency is aware some people are experiencing issues with the new portals and has apologised for the disruptions. The feedback from our provider members about the NDIA staff has been extremely positive. Uh, they're now trying to uh, administer emergency payments to providers to keep their heads above water, essentially. Those emergency payments, though, require extra administration work, and it's time many simply don't have. In some instances, service providers are even considering halting assistance. I wonder what a GP practice, for example, would do if Medicare didn't work for a month. Anyone who's been financially impacted is being urged to contact the number below. Mike Lorigan, NBN News. A usual morning at work. And then this. Robert Burton was confronted with a large knife at his Hamilton news agency. He was muffled and uh, had his face covered and I couldn't understand his first directions and I sort of asked him again and he said uh, something, robbery, knife. It was then the 61-year-old's instincts took over, hurling a tin of pens and a lamp at the offender before he fled empty-handed. All the while an elderly customer was nearby, the brief encounter at 6 o'clock on Saturday morning lasting just 10 seconds. They just arced up, yeah. Something kicked in. Robert says it's the first time an incident like this has happened since he took ownership of the business eight years ago. He hasn't let it slow him down, though. It's been business as usual since. It's a great place, a good community. Police are still on the hunt for the man responsible. He's described as being around 170 centimetres tall with a slim build. He was wearing a grey hoodie with the word tap out across the front and was last seen at the intersection of Beaumont and Tudor Streets. The information we've got so far, he's, he's walked some distance prior to the news agency with the hoodie above his head, so um, we, we haven't been able to identify him at this stage. Anyone with information is urged to contact Newcastle Police. Renee Fetter, NBN News. From Argentine to Cardiff, Dudley to Catherine Hill Bay, some pubs may have come and gone over the years, but their stories remain. 
Very significant wrong for those who enjoyed the doom and drink. And just like the yarn spun over a cold one, each and every hotel has its own unique tale to tell. In the tired hotel days, if you came here to the Ocean View, you'd be drinking Castle Main Woods Brothers beers. After 1921, that'd be Tooth and Company. The importance of these grand buildings has never been forgotten, especially not by historian and author Ed Tonks. Delving deep into the history of 44 Lake Macquarie hotels from 26 locations in his new book, Smelter's Haven to Artist's Rest. In the early days, coronial inquests were held in hotels. Why do you think, Tyson? It's thirsty work. Not thirsty work, you need something cold. You need the cool room and that's where the body was kept. In 1904, there were 27 pubs operating across most of Lake Macquarie, thanks mainly to a boom in coal mining. Despite a decline in mining in the 50s, today, 23 of the pubs documented in the book are still operating. Amazingly, 18 of the hotels were operated by female licensees. The whole character of uh, hotels in the old days to now has changed dramatically. Uh, and many hotels have got to uh, try and reinvent themselves to stay economically viable. The book will be released to the public at Belmont Pub on Tuesday. Tyson Cottrell, NBN News. She's a three-time Olympian and the reigning WNBL MVP, but that wasn't enough to earn Susie Batkovic a place on the Australian team. You know, the international game's different as well. It's not the WNBL, you know, there's four or five players on each team that are really big and they're mobile. So, you know, we're pretty excited about the group we've picked and uh, we think it's pretty balanced. Clearly shattered, Batkovic wasn't ready to talk on camera today, but there's plenty of speculation Susie and coach Brendan Joyce simply don't get along. Our greatest ever female basketballer Lauren Jackson was one of hundreds of people who took to social media to express their disbelief at Batkovic's omission. Only an injury to Liz Cambage or Mariana Tolo will see Susie on a plane to Brazil. As much as it's very exciting for the 12s to make it, it's, it's devastating for those that didn't and have put in all that hard work. Hunter fans still had reason to celebrate today with fellow Novocastrian Katie Ray Ebsery named in the squad. I was really emotional, um, obviously super excited, but yeah, a little bit surreal. Um, all the sort of hard work is finally paying off and it was really nice just to get that recognition. The Opals will head to the US next week for a series of warm-up games against the host nation, Canada and France. International experience isn't an issue um, and I think we're all sort of working in the right direction and toward the same goal and I think that, um, yeah, we're going to be fine heading into the Olympics. He has to complete two more sessions but Mullen remains on track to face the storm on Sunday. The coach says the 5'8 will add plenty to the young Newcastle lineup. In the close loss we actually had against Melbourne, his kicking game and chase game was really good. So, yeah, you know, that, um, that the, the kicking game and the experience are probably two real highlights that, that he can bring to the team. Chris Adams will also return to first grade following 18 months in the Newcastle competition. With Tyler Randall out for a month with a rib injury and Danny Levi facing back surgery, Adams will get a big chance to prove he belongs. You know, he's got better from week to week um, and as you probably noticed Beds is putting plenty of time into him but look I think whatever Chris does in week one he'll do better in week two and whatever he does in two he'll do better in three. Young forward Josh King is already in talks with the Knights about renewing his contract. He's still adapting to life in the NRL while also working as an electrical apprentice. In reserve grade I was trying to every week push out 60 plus minutes sort of thing and then going into first grade after 20 minutes you just you're completely buggered kind of thing so it's, it's very different but I guess it's just adapting to the, the the pace of the game. This week he'll square off against some of the best in the game. I just see them as another player you know you don't you're not thinking about oh 
there's there's Cameron Smith or Cooper Cronk or anything like that. You just go out there and play your game. And that's what I hope to do this weekend, just go out there and do the best I can. Two years after his death, the family of Kieran Priestland was today forced to relive the night the 18-year-old was savagely stabbed to death. On day one of the trial, the court heard Rachel Manevsky was having drinks with her then-boyfriend Andrew Perkins and Mr Priestland's ex-girlfriend at a home at Niagara Park in February 2014 when the deceased arrived. Crown Prosecutor Brendan Campbell told the court a heated argument broke out between the Central Coast teenager and his ex, in which he threatened to kick Perkins's mother's car before leaving. Hours later, Mr Priestland's former partner asked him to pick her up. The Crown alleges when he arrived, she heard both Manevsky and Perkins saying, I'm going to f kill him, before running into the kitchen and rummaging through drawers. It's alleged Mr Priestland's former partner saw Manevsky and Perkins at the driver's side door and when she got to the car, Kieran Priestland was soaked in blood. He'd been stabbed in the chest six times. The court also heard Manevsky told her uncle Perkins had walked past her to go outside and when she got there it had already been done and that she washed a knife with detergent and put it back in the knife holder. Defence barrister John Fitzgerald labelled Mr Priestland's ex-girlfriend as an unreliable witness due to her consumption of alcohol and cannabis, arguing Manevsky's only involvement was acting to protect the man she was in love with. The trial continues. Emma Murphy, NBN News. Blue skies, but as tourists found out, Newcastle today was far from picture perfect. For Instagram, anything's possible, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> the ideal day to stay indoors, but the harbour side was bustling. Of all things, Pokemon Go bringing them out. Like other people aren't out, so you're like, it's the prime time. At Nobby's, the flags were up, for some, the summer clothes were on, and unbelievably, people were braving the water. Penny, I just jump in. When it's cold, it's good for your immune system. <laughs> My body's pretty frozen. The wind peaked mid-morning, and if it felt like freezing, that's because it was. Reaching speeds of 87 kilometres an hour in Williamtown, the wind chill factor made it feel like a freezing minus one degree when it was actually 11. In Scone, winds hit 50 kilometres an hour, but it still felt like one and a half when it was nine. And at Nobby's, when gusts reach 85 kilometres an hour, the wind chill was minus one degree, far cooler than what it was. It is incredibly windy out in the open and it's making it even colder as well. But thankfully, the worst of it is right now. It's going to start easing off overnight, although that brings its own set of problems. And they'll actually ease really quite quickly and that means some pretty cold nights, freezing nights in fact, will now settle in. Good news for most, but the wind will be missed by some. And then I saw that it was windy and I was like, well, bring a coat. Samuel Jordan, NBN News.
After 120 years, today the curtain came down on the New Lambton Fire Station. It has a lot of memories and a lot of exciting things have happened here. Been a lot of laughs and there's been a lot of big jobs. The building vacated, relics of years gone by, packed up, ready to be moved. It's sad to see it go, I've been here for 15 years, but uh, it's all part of progress. Out of the old and into the new. The Specialised based in Lambton is now in operation, combining the suburb's existing service with New Lambton and Hamilton. It's great for them to move into a modern facility. All up, 60 permanent and retained staff will operate out of the new headquarters. Fitted out with living space upstairs, fitness equipment downstairs. It has all of the old classics as well as some revolutionary features. We've got some technological advances that do assist such as uh, GPS tracking on vehicles so we can see where those vehicles are. We have mobile data terminals. It's being used for training now but this room also doubles as an operations centre coordinating the response to major fire and rescue incidents. That's going to be great to have that at our fingertips. It's unclear what will happen with the now redundant stations, but Fire and Rescue says its response to incidents won't be affected. We maintain that same uh, coverage in, in the areas that we're looking for. It gives us that weight of attack. A monumental change, but firefighters are on board. It's good for everybody, good for training, good for learning and good for uh, teamwork and community. Samuel Jordan, NBN News. Primping and preening today for what will no doubt be chaos tomorrow. We are fine-tuning our visual merchandisers are working with the, with the, the last uh, spots to, to make it as attractive and as efficient tomorrow because we, we are expecting quite a lot of people. A few thousand, in fact, with a huge opening party planned for the big day. The Swedish clothing giant is fast making its mark on shopping centres around the world, with over 4,000 stores across 62 countries. But the big name did have humble beginnings. It started almost 70 years ago, back in 1947 in, in Sweden, with our founder, uh, Erling Persson. He just travelled to the US after the war ended and uh, saw that you could actually sell quality fashion to very good prices. The company's Australian presence has expanded rapidly since landing on our shores in 2014. In fact, four more stores will open in New South Wales in the next few weeks. But the Charlestown outlet should more than suffice the Hunter. At 3,000 square metres, it's one of the biggest in the country outside a capital city. Here we have a, a full men's department, ladies' department, kids. And what's also is uh, new for H&M since a few, few seasons ago, it's home. Doors open at 10am. Georgina Smythe, NBN News. He enjoyed a stint in the NBL with the Hunter Pirates, but Adam Melmoth's true passion for basketball lies with the Newcastle Hunters. Saturday's clash with Maitland is likely to be his last for the team at Broadmeadow. It's going to be a, a big part of my life that is not going to be there anymore, and, but I'll be, I'll be coming along, I'll be in the stands cheering for him, and that a little bit on the opposite side of the court, a bit closer to the bar. He bleeds green and it's just, I'm so excited, literally getting goosebumps thinking about it, and I'm just... I'm sure I'll, I'll get as emotional as he will on, uh, on Saturday night. So it's really important that we send him out a winner. A win over the Mustangs would make the occasion even more special. 
Oh, it's always good to beat Maitland. You know, it's the, the, the two games you circle on the calendar every year is the, the home and away game against Maitland. Make sure we get that Kibble Mallon Cup back home in Newcastle where it belongs. The 38-year-old has never won a grand final in the top division, despite appearing in the decider at least five times. Could 2016 provide a dream farewell? We're starting to roll, we're starting to come into some form, and um, but there's still an awful lot of work ahead of us. We played out one of our better games of the year on the weekend versus Manly, so if we can carry that form through, we're quietly confident we can be there at the end. Big man Russell Hinder is set to return to the US after the last regular season game on July 24. He's desperate to return for the finals weekend on August 13, as long as his Californian-based wife says yes. It's currently in discussion. <laughs> we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to wait and see. <laughs>Even the staff got in on the act. Before the wait was finally over. 
For Charlestown Square, today's opening was the culmination of two years of planning and 12 months of major construction work. The store employing 85 locals. I think retail in the Hunter is alive and kicking and uh, that's, that's being exemplified today. Professor Morris Oldman from the University of Newcastle believes H&M's arrival is a good sign for the region's economy and says it could also attract other businesses. These companies usually make these decisions based on the analysis of consumer demand and sustainability into the future. So I think it's a very, so this is very positive for the Hunter. H&M is the first major international retailer to arrive at Charlestown Square, but it might not be the last. Management has confirmed it's in the final discussions of securing another. Can't announce them at the moment, I'm afraid. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Renee Fetter, NBN News. It may look similar to the bevy of new housing developments in the Hunter Valley, but this site has a very different purpose. It's been specifically designed for those in their twilight years. Relax and make the resident feel at comfort and at ease and to be able to, I guess, in, enjoy a lifestyle at, at the later stages of their life. Work is well underway on Strathon's $23 million aged care development in Scone. The first stage, a 16-bed dementia-friendly home, will open in a matter of weeks. Once we fill that first house, run it for a few months and then we'll open up the second one. So there'll be another six, 16 beds available and so on and so forth. Every inch of these homes are designed to make life more comfortable. They're also breaking down the misconception that older residents are out of touch with technology. We do have fibre connectivity to the site and it's uh, a very high speed connectivity. We're running at a, a 200 meg connection. The rooms don't come cheap though. To secure one, residents need a refundable deposit of $400,000 or the daily rental equivalent or you can even do a combination of both. So it's quite flexible now as to, to how your pricing can be structured. The development, a sign of the times, with the number of people aged over 65 set to skyrocket over the next few decades. Mike Lorigan, NBN News. pretty nervous. Um, it's the first time I've been to Europe but I know it'll be a humbling experience. We're expecting there'll be about three and a half million to four million actually for World Youth Day itself which, which goes for a week. We had to complete a photo um, scavenger hunt. So the children were sent um, their special missions from the big boss. Ashley Cornish, former girlfriend of Kieran Priestland and today key witness in his murder trial. The 21-year-old was present the night Mr Priestland was killed after arriving to pick her up from her friends, Andrew Perkins. She told Newcastle Supreme Court when Mr Priestland arrived and was waiting outside the Niagara Park property, she overheard both Perkins and his girlfriend, Rachel Manevsky, say, I'm going to kill him. Ms Cornish says, when they both got up to go outside, I thought they were walking me out and it was a figure of speech. 
Telling the jury, I saw them leave Andrew's room, then they went into the kitchen. I heard the cutlery drawers. I heard yelling, claiming she then saw Manevsky and Perkins outside at the driver's side door of Mr Priestland's car. Ms Cornish told the court when she approached the car, she saw Mr Priestland sitting motionless in the driver's seat. His mouth was open and his body covered in blood. Ms Cornish's triple zero call from that night was then played to the court. In it, a frantic Ms Cornish could be heard saying, I can't look at him, he's f***ing dying in my arms. I can't do this, oh my God, he's dead in my arms. And, baby please you can't leave me, I love you so much, I'm sorry. Kieran's mother, Jennifer Priestland, also took to the stand. She told the jury how she tried to comfort Mr Priestland when he had arrived home earlier that night, after he told her Ashley had cheated on him. Ms Priestland claimed she wasn't aware Kieran left the house and returned to pick Ashley up, telling the court that was the last time I saw my son. Emma Murphy, NBN News. With three months before round one, Scott Miller hasn't completed his recruitment drive for the upcoming season. The loss of young defender Daniel Alessi to an ACL injury leaves the coach with an extra decision to make. We need to really look at what we do in that area of the field and if from a perspective now that we may feel we have enough cover with flexibility within the squad we can invest that money elsewhere. Miller will use every fit player in his squad for the clash with Northern New South Wales at Magic Park on Wednesday including a host of youth team players. As for the NPL representatives, the Jets coach says it's a great chance for them to showcase their talent. But it's unlikely players such as Broadmeadows' James Vigili or Edgeworth's Japanese star Moriyasu will earn themselves an A-League contract. Uh, listen, there's no spots for those minimum wage players at this point, so um, it's not a personal thing regarding any of these players. It's where I come into the club and where I find the salary cap position at this point. Significantly, my interest is the higher echelon player from Europe and uh, to really improve the squad. One player who is on Miller's radar is former victory forward Andrew Nabu. Following a stint in Malaysia, he's in the hunter for at least a week to push for a contract. Mentally he's brought an edge to the group, physically he's certainly got a presence, but uh, technically he's, uh, he hasn't surprised me because I knew his ability, but I think he uh, can add value to the squad if the decision goes that way. I'm sure he'll be nice and sore and battered and bruised and you know when he comes back to training I'm, I'm sure he'll be, uh, he'll be fit enough and he'll be pretty keen to go. Oh Dane, he might have been biting off more than he could chew there, he had about a bloody 20 inch reach um, disadvantage there so no, but, you know that's what State of Origin is, it's all, it's all passion.